the service building, we are providing our basic needs for citizens of all of Holland County. With that being said, I go ahead and um, make the motion, but it, if we've gone through the numbers too, and if you look here through 2016, we will still continue a positive growth in our reserve balance by make without the state funding, continuing the service as it now stands, we will continue an upward trend in our revenue growth or our, our reserve growth. It won't be as fast as it's happening right now, but if the sales tax run at five percent next year instead of three percent, which by all indications it will, of course we're, our growth will be even quicker. So with all that being said, if it's understandable, I would go ahead and make a motion to continue our 411 service in full um, until we hear further from... When you say in full, that's as we have it now. As, we, as, 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 it exists. Exists. as it exists right now. Until the end of September 2015. I'm actually going to say until we have further uh, information from the state on funding. Com yeah. confirmation. confirmation from the state on our funding. And then we can revisit the issue. So continue to 411 service as it is currently being provided until such time we have confirmation uh, on the funding issue from the state. Instead of coming back two months from now and we're still negotiating back to the state board of the uh, I just wanted to, to throw in there also that if from the community meetings, uh, the things we were hearing, and the fact that if we stopped the service, it wouldn't be a, a big monetary cost for operations. That was one of the things you wanted to know. But what I think the, the bigger issue would be is the, the loss of the veteran services. And then if we stopped it for a month or two, if we're still trying to decide the loss of jobs. So if we stopped it for a month, somebody's going to you know, lose their job. And the same thing with educational opportunities. Um, we were told that if we stop the service, I'm not going to have any way to get to school, so I have to drop out. Um, and then another thing, and we're going to provide you with more information for that meeting um, coming up from an you know, operational standpoint. We'll go into Deception Pass and make sure we can do that. Um, the Soundview Shopper, our stop is on the highway, and so someone would have to, so we would have to negotiate getting a stop. And then another thing to think about would be shelter because the weather's getting ready to change. We have a lot of transfer people. And sometimes we need 10 or 15 minutes waiting on SCAT or them waiting on us. So that's gonna be important to make sure whatever we're doing that there's shelter, maybe parking, and lastly, probably a bathroom. Um, and whatever we do, if we stop the service and start it, they, the public talked about you know just that, that trust of being able to trust the service. But the ramification, excuse me just a second. Right now we have a motion, and we should have a second before we have I, I this second, discussion. I second uh, Richard Hannell's uh, motion to continue the service 100% uh, 411 uh, W and C, and well, to continue all of our connectivity to Camino Island. That would include 412. No, no, no. 412 that, hasn't been in existence for a long time. It's not okay, to 411 uh, W and C until such time as we have uh, confirmation from the state as to what our funding what funding support will be. Okay, the motion is made by Rick Handel and seconded by Mr. Suffer that we continue the 411 W and the 411C until such time as we have confirmation that there's funding that is currently approved by the legislature is uh, available. Any further discussion? One point, um, if, if for some reason funding doesn't happen and if the board chooses that service is going to be canceled, uh, we just need enough time in there that we have, we can talk to the people, give them time, just like we did this time, so that if it's cancels, it's not canceled immediately, if there's a month at least in there, to work with them. Right. If, if, if once we get clarification or confirmation from the state yeah. at that time, any any action that would be taken by the transit system would need to be approved by the board. I think you know that's one of the reasons for having a defined date. We well, know that based on 
uh, if they come back in a month and say that no, you're not getting the funding at that point, then the board can have that discussion. Okay, it, you know, at least at least publicly, if the public is it up in the air. Yeah, they they know this is. I think they will know that this is going to go for at least two months. Mm -hmm. We're going to extend it when when the information goes into the newspaper, whatever. They're just they're going to be talking about this area of gray. How long is this going to last? Now, having said that, uh, when we look at the our revenues and our expenses, if we don't get them, first of all, the million dollars is tied to us. You're on the wrong grant. Yeah. That's the wrong grant. grant. Like four eleven is a different funding. I have the floor right now. Okay. okay, so let me right. go through this. It's a package, the whole thing is a package. And when we get to the other grant, the million, that is going to be tied to charging fares, which we do not have the funds to implement that system to charge fares. The way it's been explained to me, and I have an email from Senator Bailey, I can read it to you, and I'm not going to go through the whole process. If the, if the governor doesn't swallow this or, or throw this poison pill, whatever that term is out there, where we don't get the money, we can use that money for the Tri-County Connector. She's specific about it's Tri-County Connector. We have to have a contract, sign a contract with DOT. The funds are operated through the Department of OFM. We pay it up front. We get reimbursed up to that point. And we can use those funds to implement a fair system that would allow us to get the other million dollars in place for what that money is here on for. That's the connection that I'm trying to make with okay. okay, but yeah, I, I, I agree with that. And I spoke with Barty, Barbara Bailey at length yesterday, and yes, the money that we have, can, uh, if we get that $2.3 million, it can be used for capital improvements, which would be installation of fare boxes on the buses. For However, the $2.3 million, it states specifically in the first sentence of that funding bill, is for the 411 route. The 2.3 million? The 2.3 million. The, the, million. the, the 1 million is for the 412. They're not connected. They are two different funding sources. One is a grant, one is funding. You need to be clear on that. The $2.3 million is for funding for the 411 connector. Okay, you have the floor. He has the floor right now. Okay. Uh, Rick, I would like to add that the $1 million for the 412 is supposed to be split 50 50 yeah. with Skagit. <coughs> And it's for two years. Yes, correct. so it's actually two hundred and fifty thousand per year. That's correct. But that's, that's which is a, a small amount compared to the cost of implementing the fares. Right, but I, I uh, Rick, Rick, hold on, please. He has the floor. Okay, okay. Well, I thought he was done. I guess unless we find some magic way to implement fares that is cost, it's very low cost. Uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars uh, would. I don't know how far that would go, even to implementing fares on the Everett connector. That, uh, in cooperation with Skagit, it might be possible. But those, are, I agree with Rick that those are two different pots of money, and they're for two different things. That's correct. Yeah. Yes, that's. I am just wanting to make sure that everybody on the board and everybody in the public is very well aware that this is not a package deal between the two bills. They are two separate bills for two separate routes. The discussion we are having right now is for the 411C and the 411W. Is that for the million dollars? Or that is for the $2.3 million <coughs> over two years. Over two years to fund the 411. Right, that's for Camino, Mount Vernon, and for March Point, 
conversation. That is the route it's funded. It requires no match, and it can be used for all direct and indirect expenses of that. So, and that is the discussion and the, the movement or the motion I put on the table is to continue the 411 as we currently are providing it at least until such time we have clarification or contract from the state. Okay, and so 30 days beyond that allow our <laughs> That's the motion we have a second we had discussion and I put one piece of clarification into this for the discussion. I'm going to read a section of this email that I received from Senator Bailey and she gave me information about Haley Gamble um, and quite frankly I don't know who it is, how it's related to DOT, but this is the way this goes. Senator, this is Haley Gamble writing to Senator Bailey. I spoke with DOT about $2.3 million available for Island Transit for the Tri-County Connector to have a couple of updates for you. As you know, the funds are essentially earmarked for the Tri-County Connector and Island Transit. There are no special requirements that Island Transit must meet to access these funds. As is standard, Island Transit will need to sign an agreement with WashDOT that they will use these funds for the stated purpose. My understanding is WashDOT has met with the Board of Island County Transit and is currently writing <coughs> a prospective scope of work and will be funded for the Tri-County Connector. The Transit will then need to sign this document or suggest changes if there are any concerns. This is standard practice for the funds that the state provides to local agencies. They will then have access to the $2.3 million on a reimbursement basis, in quotation marks, as they spend funds on the Tri County Connector from July um, 1, 2015. So it starts in July 1, 14 and they can submit those costs cost, cost for reimbursement up to $2.3 million. WashDOT will attend the Island Transit meeting on July 24th, which I thought they were coming here. No, August 10th. Okay. Uh, so it's going to be August 10th and can answer any remaining questions at that time. There are no such matches for the $2.3 million grant. The bill containing the spending details for all the transportation funds, and this is for that Senate Bill 5988 will be signed by the governor today, it was signed, and washed out will need to work with the Office of Financial Management, that's the OFM, on the exact timing and release of the funds for everything in the bill. Knowing that Island Transit is in urgent need of these funds, DOT will be working with OFM on this immediately. I also left this message for OFM about this today. I know Audit in transit is meeting on July 24th to discuss cancellation of the 411 route. <coughs> WashDOT is working to get all the needed paperwork taken care of, the top priority. To be clear, the funds are 100% available, and the question is just when, not if. So this $2.3 million is, according to this, is clearly for the Tri-County Connector. Yes, which is the 411. The 412 is the Everett connector. Okay. So, we're talking about the same thing. No, we're not. No. The $2.3 million is for the 411. The one point million, or the $1 million, which is split with Skagit, is for the Everett connector. So this, what, okay. you, what they're telling you here is this is, the bill has been signed, it's been approved, and they're separate bills. So. Anyway, let's move this one along. So I would add uh, the 30-day uh, provision as a as an amendment. I propose to the to the motion that I second. Uh, you're at, you're adding a friendly amendment to this. Yes, that that it would extend 30 days beyond uh, uh, if we uh, fail to get funding from the state. A 30-day notice. Yeah. And financially, we're talking about going out 90 days now, potentially. Yeah, that makes sense to me, and it, I think it, it's what we owe our riders. You no, know, we're still seeing fuel savings every month. We saw that fuel chart I showed you. Um, yeah, we're, we're <coughs> saving uh, $35,000 a month, I think, in, in 
the fuel. Um, price is going up, so that's in the narrow, but I think we, we could handle that financially to add another 30 days. And we're bringing 100000 from the first six months after paying for the uh, federal uh, Let me state the motion there. The motion is for made by Mr. Sumner to provide 30 days, 30 days notice before termination of the 411 service if we receive notice that the other is not available. There's a second. There's a second by Mr. Hanno. And any further discussion on that friendly amendment? Okay. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Now we go to the main motion, which is to um, continue 411 service as it exists. 411 W as it exists today for an indefinite period of time pending the confirmation that the funds are still available from, from the state. From the state. Um, any further discussion on that one? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. On the opposed, the motion carries unanimously. So the 411 service is going to continue indefinitely pending the outcome of the governor's action on the so called poison pill. And then we get to wrestle with this one later. So, item number two. Go on to item number two. This is a letter on behalf of the Island Transit Board of Directors regarding the business rule of 411 411C. And that one is pretty much wrapped up by the last yeah, one. I was going to say that was not applicable. So, the only reason I put it in here was because it was a motion to send this. I think you need to make a motion to not. Yeah. I will move that the board not send a letter from the board of directors regarding the discontinuation of the route for. 11W and 411C is originally moved. Is there a second? I second it. All right. Ms. Henderson uh, made the motion to rescind the previous direction to send the letter on behalf of the Auto Transit Board regarding the discontinuation for 11. Second by Mr. Uh, Sunberg. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries, so we can move on to item number three, the resolution of uh, 7-15, the resolution of the Board of Directors on the Transit Doctrine and Revised Pilot Transit Procurement Policy Procedure. Robin, are you leading with that one? No. Oh, I have a couple of comment. Um, as one of the items are to uh, close out the SDR grant, um, first we need to close out audit findings and review findings that we, we uh, occurred in the spring. Uh, the audit findings came from the uh, Washington State Auditors and the review findings came from a review that we had in late May. And their recommendation was for us to update the grant procurement policies and procedures so they were more inclusive of the items that are included in that. FTA circular uh, 4221S that Matt was speaking to last meeting. And so the, these policies and procedures have been updated and they've been reviewed by FTA consultants and they're satisfied that they're inclusive of the items that uh, are required by the FTA. But they, they need us to approve those policies and procedures before they can check that off their list and um, in, in their effort to close out the audit findings uh, with the agency. So uh, here they are, they're before you, they're about 50 pages in length, and uh, there's a lot of material in there, but uh, we started with uh, an FTA template and uh, updated it, and it's pretty much been approved by those consultants as satisfactory, so um, my request is that we, we pass that to be forward that we'll have to close out. I, I recall when you started this uh, project, you said it didn't involve really uh, very many substantial changes, but reformatting and following their, mm -hmm. uh, their scheduled format. Yeah, our past policies and procedures include 
many of these items. Mm -hmm. um, but this one's a little more comprehensive um, and more up to date. So, so there were some updates, as references, and footnotes, and that sort of stuff. And it's just, um, it, it's just uh, it's more comprehensive and it's approved by the, the people that work with this every day. So they're satisfied. And I am too. But the, the, the next step will be implementing this policy, of course. But, um, this, this is what the FCA is asking us to do in order to move forward and close out the other Okay. Are there any alligators in this? Alligators? Yeah. I, I see it. Legal saying no. Oh, I was good. that was going to be my question. Has legal reviewed this? Yeah, actually. I, today I got a federal template and I tweaked it a bit to use a bluntly statement of The other thing I did is I changed the language in the uh, resolution just to say that. Uh, we have a, a number of resolutions that were previously adopted, and I basically kept alive anything that's still relevant in any of those other ones uh, if they were not addressed in this new one. So uh, I think somewhere along the line it would be a good idea to have a comprehensive review of not just the procurement policies and procedures, but probably just kind of a global good housekeeping review. And, uh, possibly you might see this again in a more comprehensive tie pre-existing resolution policies that weren't particular in this one but still are relevant, so uh, which would be a bit of a job. But this one does totally comply with the current FDA, the current circular, which is necessary. How does this relate to be specific about some examples? How does it relate to the closeout of this book? Well, um, in order for us to really close the grant, FTA needs to give their summary and approval to, I think it's the Office of the Inspector General, which is one level above that in D.C. Mm -hmm. And the, one of the items on our checklist is audit findings. We need to resolve those audit findings. And they want some assurance that we're going to be following the rules for their circular in the future. And the way that they... I guess get some comfort in that is if we change our policies and procedures to fall in line exactly with their their rules, uh, their, their grant rules. And so by us updating our policy to put it in line with their the rules that they've established around these grants, that gives them a, a level of assurance that uh, we're going to be following the rules. And if we don't, then they they can come back to us and say you, you haven't been following your own policy. And what I've read through the, uh, and this is for the construction and the RFP for architects, there's a checklist of what they have to do in their RFP and in their contract. And if you have any commission for this building, there's the, there's the whole book of items in there that the commissioning officer has to sign off on. And URS was involved in it initially as an asset manager. I could not find anything in our records where URS signed off on this. There's one letter in there by Arthur Rose uh, doing a, uh, she, they basically took the position as the commission officer on this building without having sign off from the architect of record. And the architect of record was out of the picture in the correspondence that I could find. He is back in the picture. In most cases, on a federally funded or state funded project, the architect of record has to sign off on that building because that is part of the contract documents related to the grant. Is this a requirement in this procurement uh, package that you can think of? Will that be part of the chain of acceptance going through FTA and, and up through? Um. You know, I, from what I've read so far, there, there's a couple of different documents they put out. There's a 4221 F, you can find it on their website. That's like uh, their rule book, you might say. And then they have a guide of uh, procedures that you should follow. Um, from reading those two, I didn't notice that specific procedure. Um, but there, what they're, I think, primarily concerned with is that a lot of the clauses that you put into your contracts are there to protect your agency in case there is a problem somewhere in the line. Um, and so they're really 
Um, they're, they're really intent on seeing that you put a lot of these protective clauses into the contracts. Buy America is one. Buy American is another. Um, and we have the debarment suspension. Um, there's just a whole grouping of, of clauses. And actually, the, the reviewers, when they came out, they didn't have issue with those clauses. They thought that our contracts were pretty well constructed. It's, where they had issue was there were certain decisions that were maybe made where it wasn't fully documented. And that uh, doesn't mean it wasn't done. It means it wasn't fully got that. Well, in, in, in the case of the building, I can get through this resolution here in a second. Tom Whitaker, the architect, um, did not have a better opinion based on what the problems are than that slab. He was, he was out of the loop. And, <coughs> and I, I was concerned and am concerned without having written document from him, a memorandum from him describing what the problem is, why it's that way, and what is the correction as the architect of record that they would recommend. We're, we're kind of wandering out there on our own, on our own judgments without really tying the design and performance with the contract. And that, that's where we're going right now. I think legally um, and procedurally, So I don't think this resolution uh, touches on that very much. This is it's a procedural thing, yeah. and I just want to know if we were going to cover in that procurement procedure uh, by closing out this building. Because you did mention that today. You mean the actual close out of the floor? Yeah. Um, okay. I think they're watching everything, but um, they're they're concerned primarily with two things right now. Actually, three things that they've been on my plate. Policies and procedures need to be updated and approved. Um, we want to see the, um, the, the audit items resolved and paid back. And the third thing is to make sure that there's proper training um, so that we don't have any problems in the future, that things will be implemented properly. So they, they really they put some emphasis on those three items. Um, then, then there's, of course, the closeout on the other side, the financial and the budget side, and, and um, make sure that procedurally the grant's closed out. And, and that, I think, brings in the issue of getting permission um, to ret release retainage through the state agencies, which we're, we, we've applied for that. Um, and it's just a matter of their approval and then sending out letters and that sort of stuff. Uh, and then getting into the, um, going back to the FTA and, and formally saying, we want to close this out. So in layman's terms, this is one piece of all that puzzle. One piece on the checklist that's very important to the FTA because they're taking this, these pieces and then taking it forward to the next agency who's holding them accountable and asking to close this, these audit items. Jack, do you have a set of words? No, I don't have any questions on this one. No. Any comments from the gentleman? I just, my brain's kind of scrambled on it, but it seems like the reading this seems rather routine, but as you explained, well, there's, there's a little more to it, closing out and all. I, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand when we discussed the slab because I wasn't here. Are we talking about the base of the building? The concrete slab has the floor, the floor yeah. Yeah, has, has a number of checks and, and actually some fairly pronounced crap. And in there, there the are large checks. I'm sorry. In the maintenance building. In the maintenance building. The maintenance building. Uh -huh. yeah. So they didn't, they, they underestimated the quality of the concrete and the weight that was going on it? Is, is that what, no. is that what happened? Um, in, in construction terms, first of all, um, I'll just give a brief description on that so we can get back to move this resolution along. The slab has a double mat rebar throughout the whole thing without separations in the slab when they 
pour each big slab like that. Mm -hmm. They pour a section, then they pour another section, but the rebar is continuous, mm -hmm. and there's no separation in the rebar from one mat to the next. And right. so concrete is in its most expanded form when it's wet, and so when it's contracting, it's, it's fighting with the rebar, it's pulling right. on it, right. and then you pour another section another day, and that's pulling on its, its own environment in there. Yeah. And concrete is going to check anyway, but these are pretty pronounced checks out there, and it has a lot to do with, the, it's an it's a 8-inch slab, double mat, lots of rebar in it, and so there's there's forces fighting against each other, and the slab was poured that way, as it's explained to me, because of the special use of this building. It's supposed to be stand to be able to stand up under major earthquakes and other stuff as a as an emergency uh, preparedness yep. center, and um, so it's a lot of it is in the design, the structural design of that slab, and it's it's. It's cosmetic, but it was an issue for uh, the previous administration. The, the language that I read in the correspondence was, this does not meet my expectation, but it meets the design. <laughs> okay, so I don't want to say, I think it'll move along. That, yep. that explains that. Thank you. So with that being said, I'll move that we approve resolution 715. I said that. Okay, Mr. Hanel uh, made a motion to approve resolution 7 15, seconded by Ms. Henderson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any aye. Opposed? Aye. Opposed? That motion carries, so we'll move on to business item number four the approval of the FTA audit and the FDR repayment calculation. Yes, sir. We're still in there. Go ahead. Okay. Um, as part of this process, uh, we had an FTA consultant um, that created a schedule, a calculation of what we they believe we owe uh, based on the various items that were reported by the Washington State Auditors. And they came to a figure of approximately $110,000. Uh, they're requesting that we pay that as soon as possible. Um, because there is also interest that is not included in that figure that will be computed um, from the date in which we pay. So, the from estimate. The date of when? Well, if we pay it today, then they, they are going to calculate how, how long we've held that money. Um, and it's, there, there were various points at which we, that money was released. And so they'll calculate the interest on all those small pieces over time. And. Um, you know, it'll probably be a couple thousand dollars, two or three thousand dollars, and, and we'll see that expense in the future. Um, but this is the first item, and they're, they're, again, this is another item on our checklist they want to see completed before they can offer a recommendation to the next level. So the will be paying that are off Okay. I'd make a motion for payment of the uh, FDA audit. Uh, repayment calculation. Second. Mr. Hanel moved that uh, the motion is moved the board approve the payment of the FTA audit of the SGR repayment uh, amount based on the calculations of $109,942. And, and a second by uh, Ms. Henderson. Any uh, further discussion? I just point out that it is uh, twenty thousand less than you originally estimated. So in the budget we or in the <coughs> savings that we are realizing this year, uh, it's good that it's under rather than over. Should we amend that motion since it's been seconded uh, to include the language plus interest? Well, yeah. Um, it's a yeah. Choice. yeah. So who wants to make a friendly amendment? Yeah, I've been my own motion. Sure. No, once it's, on the table, once it's on the table, that motion belongs to the board. So it's uh, well, I'd be comfortable saying plus interest as a friendly amendment. Okay. It's a friendly amendment to this. I'm going to streamline this. 
to amend the original motion to include the words plus interest. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Hearing none. So the friendly, the friendly amendment to the motion is to add the words plus interest. So we'll, we'll vote on the main motion to approve the payment at the end for the SDR repayment calculation of $109,942. All, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. So we'll move on to business item number five. The approval of the public hearing at the August 28, uh, 2015 PTBA board meeting to receive input on island transit, six year transit development plan of 2015 through 2020. Who's doing that presentation? I move to hold the Senate public hearing date for August 28, 2015 in order for the PPBA board to meet uh, or receive input from the public on Island Transit's six-year transit development plan. I second it. Okay. There's been a motion by Mr. Hamill on business item number five, second by Mr. Eric <laughs> Sumper. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? So when will we see that? Well, I think soon. Um, it, it, they all, all these pieces fit together in a way. And, um, I've done a first draft of the, of the 2016 budget, which is by our managers. They're going to get back to me with that information. And I've also been working on this TVP, which includes the budget. Um, I think that we'll probably have something ready in the next couple of weeks, probably two weeks before that meeting. That would be great. That would be great. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion on this item? Um, so the motion has been to uh, hold a public meeting at the August 28, 2015 Transit Board meeting to receive input on Island Transit's six-year transit development plan for 2015 to 2020. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? It carries unanimously. So I, I have just one other question. I do not we'll change the well, but I just wondered when will that, like, do we see it and then how do you get that out to the public? Do you on the website or? Um, we can put it on the website. I think last year it is already on the website, the six year plan from last year. Mm -hmm. okay. So this will this will extend it another year. Yeah, it just kind of shifts to one more year. Forward. And it will update, of course, the uh, 2016 figures. They'll be included in there, but um, again, this is kind of snapshot. Mm -hmm. The state's looking for a plan for the next six years uh, that they, they will review and keep on record um, with, with the understanding that it's not your exact plan. Things will change. Probably. Yeah, it's pretty hard to predict uh, both revenues and expenses six years out. Thank you. Okay. And the next item is we have an executive session regarding the collective bargaining system. Sessions, and I would like to adjourn uh, for that executive session to this small conference room in the back here. And, uh, Matt, what do you think? 15 minutes? Yeah. 15 minutes. From 11 to 11 15. Can we take a little bridge? 11 11 1105. Is there any business after that? No. And, uh, this executive session is a collective bargaining session and there will be no action taken in this meeting. And to my knowledge, there won't be any action taken even after the executive session. So, and, and we didn't get the second, we didn't get the public comments during the... Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we, we didn't get the public comments during each one, like you told us at the beginning, so. I just say not to say anything, because I now work for the Whitney Daily. Oh, I, I, got, a, I got a lot. I got a lot to say. I know you. I know. We just need to give you a microphone and a video camera. Just Fine. Say. I think you can always do that. Do you think you might be up for a, uh, to give a tour? Uh, of the facilities? I haven't had a tour yet. Me? <laughs> There's, um, I'd be happy to, but I don't think we'll let 
I can show you some dead uh, plantings now on the south end. Uh, uh, disgusting uh, uh, um, Personally, I don't personally have it. I know that we have around through the system.